Quantum mechanics, how big can you get? As I said last week, Richard Feynman has said during in his discussion of the double slit experiment, I will ta just take this one experiment which has been designed to contain all the mystery of quantum mechanics to put you up against the paradoxes and mysteries and peculiarities of nature 100%. Unfortunately, I can't do that in a Brooklyn accent. Um, <clears throat> by now, I think most people understand that the double ex uh, slit experiment can be done with light. You learned that in high school, right? It's been known since 1800 or thereabouts, about 1803 I found a published reference to it. Um, uh, Thomas Young, who interestingly enough is, was, a, uh, uh, was a physician, um, but also um, helped to translate the uh, demotic and then the hieroglyphic of the uh, Rosetta Stone. Yeah, we're talking about a guy who had wide-ranging interests. Um, and if you want to read it, as we're finding out now, almost everything can be found on the internet if you know where to look. Um, and you remember the double slit experiment, if you send light into uh, uh, two slits, if it were made out of particles, you would expect it to just simply go through and form two piles, um, perhaps with some scatter, perhaps even with some overlap, but, um, but the two piles should be going straight through. If you do it with waves, you get two overlapping ones. Um, interestingly, with waves, it also spreads out more than you would expect from uh, uh, from each slit itself um, more than you'd expect from particles. But most importantly, you get these light and dark fringes. Well, we're going to be looking at um, uh, something that will give you this kind of light pattern, only they're indisputably particles. Electrons can also exhibit this dual character it's been known for some time that they should. Uh, they did some experiments some years ago, and perhaps the best one I can tell you right now um, is uh, in 2013, controlled double slit electron diffraction. And this one is where they were very careful to do it uh, precisely correctly. And you will, you will see some of the data that we get. First, I'll read you the abstract. Double slit diffraction is a cornerstone of quantum mechanics. It illustrates key features of quantum mechanics, interference and the particle wave duality of matter. In 1965, Richard Feynman presented a thought experiment to show these features. Here we demonstrate the full realization of his famous thought experiment. And there's actually a lecture on the internet from Richard Feynman giving this uh, his view. By placing a movable mask in front of a double slit, to control the transmission through the individual slits, and we're going to see how that works. The probability distributions for single and double slit arrangements were observed. Also, by recording single electron detection events, diffracting through a double slit, a diffraction pattern was built up from individual events. They're going to slow down the electrons to one per second, and you are going to see the slow buildup. Unfortunately, I'm not going to show you the video itself, uh, because for whatever reason it doesn't, uh, didn't want to load on my computer. Um, and besides that, it would take a long time to watch it. Uh, but you can actually watch it on the internet if your computer will work on it. Um, <clears throat> their introductory paragraph starts, Richard Feynman described electron diffraction as a phenomenon which has in it the heart of quantum mechanics. In reality, it contains the only mystery. This is from a different source from what I quoted you. Um, so he says it multiple ways different, uh, diff at different times. This is probably written because it's got a source to it. He went on to describe a thought experiment for which he stated that you should not try to set up because the apparatus would have to be made on an impossibly small scale to show the effects we are interested in. Well, time marches on in those impossibly small scales have been realized. In this paper, we report 
both control over the individual slit to observe probability distributions from both single and double slits, and the buildup of a diffraction pattern at single electron detection rates to achieve the full realization of Feynman's thought experiment. We use the term buildup to, to refer to the measurement of the cumulative spatial detection pattern as a function of time. If that sounds a little bit like word salad to you, uh, when you see the pictures, I think it will be obvious what they're talking about. I'm going to skip over quite a bit of stuff. The electron source's intensity was reduced so that the electron detection rate in the pattern was about one hertz. You know how fast that is? That's one per second. Obviously, it's not always one per second, but it's, it is uh, slow enough that it is clear that the second electron doesn't enter the machine until well past the time the first electron has left it. This ensures, uh, at this rate in kinetic energy, the average distance between the consecutive electrons was 2.3 times 10 to the sixth meters. That's 2,000 kilometers. They're not influencing each other. This ensures that only one electron is present in the one meter long system at any one time, thus eliminating electron-electron interactions. So this is a single electron effect. And here's a, here's a photo. If you'll pay attention to over here, you will see that there's this uh, orange uh, mask thing with a square cut out of it. Okay, and with time it's going to slide. Here you can see when it's over both slits, you don't see any pattern. Um, now as it's moving along and you're just starting to get the first tiny glimmer of a slit, you can see that you start getting a pattern coming through. It almost like, looks faintly like it's um, a little bit of a wave pattern, but it's mostly, and here the, the slit is shown a little better, and here the slit is shown a little more, and now the second slit is starting to come into view. As this thing is sliding across, and this is what it looks like, and you can see that now you're starting to get a fairly good, the little lumpy things on the, on the inside, and when you get it to the full position, it's completely lumpy. And as you get there, you can see very clearly the interference pattern. And then as you keep going, it stays until the one side starts getting covered up part way. And now you can see the interference pattern fading and then going to almost zero, not quite, but very close. Apparently, the, the mask is not right up tight against those two slits, and so there is a little possibility that something goes through the mask and then into one of the slits that's supposed to be covered up. There's that much of a wave pattern to it. And so you get, you get a little tiny bit of, but you can see the contrast between this pattern, let's say, and that one with all those lumps in it, okay? And then as you keep going, it eventually blacks out again. Now, we're going to take that double slit pattern in the middle. This little square shows you what we're going to enlarge, and we're gonna shoot through one electron a second. On this one, if you look carefully, you can see these two electrons, okay? Then you shoot four more electrons and you get something like that. Actually, it may be five or six because some of them might go out here when they're not being recorded for, for now. But you can see it looks yeah, kind of random, right? Well, as you keep shooting more and more and more electrons through, it becomes patently obvious that there is some kind of a wave pattern that's guiding those electrons to places 
and telling them to avoid other places. There are very few electrons in here, in here. There's a, there's a scattering of them, but not very many. There's a lot more in the nodes of the waves where those waves are being reinforced. One electron at a time, you can't predict where any individual electron will go, but the pattern will show you this wave at the end. Now, this extends to atoms. Uh, Carnell and Milnick in 1991 did uh, Young's double slit experiment with atoms. And again, you can get this on the internet. An atomic interferometer based on a Young's type double slit arrangement has been demonstrated. A supersonic beam of metastable helium atoms. Why metastable? Because if you do the ordinary helium atoms, you can't tell what they're doing. Um, but the metastable ones can, uh, electron is partly kicked out. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can check what's going on with uh, certain kinds of magnetic and electric fields until when the atoms get to your detector. They, they pass through a two millimeter, mi pardon me, micrometer wide slit in a thin gold foil. This transversely coherent beam impinges on a second microfabricated transmission structure consisting of two one micrometer wide slits at a lateral distance of eight micrometers. So they're shooting helium through one slit and then through two slits and then seeing where it goes from there. This double slit defines two possible paths on which the atoms can reach the detector slit. The good visibility of the observed fringes should make it possible to measure differential phase shifts in the interferometer of one-third rad, and in case you're wondering, uh, uh, a rad is uh, uh, 57 degrees or something like that in less than 10 minutes. And here's some of the data that they had. And you can see here you have some interference, but now you're kind of losing it probably because the interference is going up so fast and, and down so fast that it's harder it's hard to make sure that you've got everything there but this where you can see there's several uh, points per each uh, interference fringe is a little bit easier to see that's because the wavelength here instead of being 0 0.56 angstroms for the helium atom yeah you can actually measure a wavelength of a helium atom um, is now 1.03 angstroms, which is, by the way, about the size of the helium atom itself. Um, uh, the conventional size, anyway. And, and you can see that they, uh, that they definitely have uh, interference fringes in the second position. Atoms, yeah, the stuff that our body is made out of, that everything that we see pretty much is made out of, except for the light itself, of course, is uh, made up of quantum objects. And here's where you can see even better the, the waveform, um, and that's the uh, uh, you can see that there's, uh, there's quite a bit of overlap that the, the troughs don't go all the way down to the zero point, but they, there's still obviously interference fringes there. Um, has to do with technical issues. Well, how big can you get? Well, the test has been extended to molecules of 60 carbon atoms, or buckyballs as they call them. Um, why do they choose them? Because they're neat little objects uh, that are very strong and hold together well. Uh, and there's et al. The final all is uh, uh, Anton Zeilinger, who pops up quite regularly in this uh, um, in this regard. And again, um, you can get it on the internet. 
Yeah. Wave particle duality is frequently the first topic students encounter in elementary quantum physics. Although the phenomena, this phenomenon has been demonstrated with photons, electrons, neutrons, and atoms, the dual quantum character of the famous double slit experiment can be best explained with the largest and most classical objects, which are currently the fullerene molecules. The soccer ball shaped carbon cages C60 are large, massive, and appealing objects for which it is clear that they must behave like particles under ordinary circumstances. We present the results of a multi-slit diffraction experiment with such objects to demonstrate their wave nature. The experiment serves as the basis for a discussion of several quantum concepts such as coherence, randomness, complementarity, and wave-particle duality. In particular, the effect of longitudinal spectral coherence can be demonstrated by a direct comparison of inferograms obtained with a thermal beam and a velocity selected beam in close analogy to the usual two slit experiments using light. Um, I'm going to skip on down and uh, read some of the um, some of the paper because these guys do a really good job of explaining I think. We thus find many fundamental quantum concepts in the concept uh, context of double slit interferometry. First, we find the complementarity between our knowledge about the particle's position and the visibility of the infer interferogram. If we open one slit only, the particle must pass this opening and the interference pattern must disappear, and does. Perfect interference contrast can be obtained only if we open the second slit and if we exclude all possibilities of detecting, even in principle, the path the object has taken. It's the basis of our knowledge and how, how good our knowledge can be. The wave particle duality stated that the description of one and the same physical object suggests the local particle picture in the source and on the screen, but a wave model for the unobserved propagation of the object. Mathematically, we describe the state of the particle during the propagation as a superposition of states goes in two different directions at once. In particular, of position states that are classically mutually dis uh, exclusive. I mean, you know that if I have a pen and it's over here, it can't be over there at the same time. I had to move it between the two, right? If you're looking at it and you see it in both places, you think something strange is going on, right? Well, meet something strange. As long as you don't look at it, it's in both places. Once you look at it, it's only in one place, and it behaves that way. A classical object will either take one or the other path. A quantum object cannot be said to do that. The intrinsic information content of the quantum system itself is insufficient to allow such a description, even in principle. We also find the duality between objective randomness and determinism. The pattern on the screen is well determined for the ensemble. We know how it's going to come out. But the detection point of a single object is completely unpredictable in all experiments. There's a pattern. It's not just a plain wash, although you can make those too. But where any one electron is going to strike, can be anywhere within that pattern. All of these quantum mysteries imply that in an experiment, the possibility of having a position is often the only objective reality, in contrast to the property of having a well-defined position. They don't even exist in one place. And now you were talking about buckyballs with 60 carbon atoms. These reasons are why Richard Feynman emphasized that the double slit experiment is at the heart of quantum mechanics. In reality, it contains the only mystery, the basic peculiarities of all quantum mechanics. Feynman gets quoted a lot, and as you can see, he's quoted in a, has been quoted from a number of different places. The fact that the wave nature of matter is a cornerstone of quantum mechanics, but that this very feature completely escapes perception in our everyday life. We don't see that 
It happens for these small objects, but we don't see it. Is one of the remarkable properties of this theory. The smallness of Planck's constant, and therefore of the de Broglie wavelength of a macroscopic object, is certainly largely responsible for the non-observability of quantum effects in the classical world. But he's saying they're there, it's just that the wavelengths are so short that it doesn't really help you that much. However, it is interesting to ask whether there are limits to quantum physics and how far we can push the experimental techniques to visualize quantum effects in the mesoscopic world. That is to say, you know, where you can see it in the you know, microscope or something like that. How big can you get? Um, <clears throat> Uh, for object of increasing size, max, mass, and complexity. And for a while, this was the record setter. We shall therefore briefly review the experimental efforts in this field throughout the last century. Soon after Louis de, de Broglie's proposed wave hypothesis for material particles, matter wave phenomena were experiment, experimentally verified for electrons, atoms, and dimers, and neutrons. Young's double slit experiment with matter waves was then demonstrated, done by Johnson for electrons, by Zeilinger and collaborators for neutrons. And notice that uh, Zeilinger got his, cut his teeth on quantum mechanics, and he's still doing it. By Carnell and Mlynick uh, for atoms, and by Sholkoff and Tennis for small molecules and noble gas clusters. So by the time they wrote this, we'd already seen, you know, dimers of molecules uh, coming through. And, you know, you think about it, this, your things would have multiple protons, neutrons in multiple different areas with electrons surrounding them. Um, but we're getting to a granddaddy of them all, the C60 experiment, the caged-like Carbon molecules earned their name fullerenes and Buckminster fullerenes because of their close resemblance to geodesic structures that were first discussed by Leonardo da Vinci and implemented in buildings in the United States by the architect Buckminster Fuller. And you've seen geodesics like this before. In fact, those of you who have been around as long as I have remember uh, Gentry Jim that had the top of a fullerene molecule. This new modification of pure carbon was discovered in 1985 by Croto et al. and shown to be particularly stable and abundant when exactly 60 carbon atoms are arranged in one molecule to form the smallest natural soccer ball we know, the buckyball, as shown in figure two. And there's figure two, and you can see a marked similarity, in fact, if you look at it, it's even more similar th than that. There's a six-sided, there's another six-sided. On either side of this are five-sided areas. See? Just like six-sided, six-sided, but on either side there's five-sided. And in fact, if you'll see, each five-sided is surrounded by six, six or by five six-sided ones, and then um, but this is all made out of carbon atoms. And that's why it's exactly 60, is because it takes 60 to, to make that construction. Fullerenes are appealing candidates because a successful quantum experiment with them would be regarded as an important step toward the realm of our macroscopic world. Many of the known physical properties of buckyballs are more closely related to a chunk of hot solid material than to the cold atoms that have so far been used in matter wave interference. They've been cooling them down and then trying to send them through because it made them more coherent. But now we're talking about roasting these things in an oven at um, I think 600 degrees centigrade or something like that, which is, I'd have to calculate, but it's close to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Really hot. And they, they hang, they're so well constructed, they hang together with that. They don't have anything but carbon in them. There's no hydrogen, there's no anything else. It's just, just 60 of carbon. By the way, one of the uses of those buckyballs uh, was as wheels for the little nano cars that uh, James Tour likes to construct and race. But uh, 
The existence of collective many particle states like plasmons and excitons, which means sometimes you can get an electron going in a strange place. Um, uh, the rich variety of vibrational and rotational modes, so that, you know, the buckyballs are, you know, carbon atoms rattling around and over on the other side, the, another one's moving. When they get hot, they have all kinds of different degrees of freedom uh, for movement. Um, as well as the concept of an internal molecular temperature. That is, how many of these things are vibrating at any given time? Um, and how fast? are only some of the clear indicators of the multi-particle composition of the fullerenes. These are not simple constructs. These are not electrons, which are, as far as we know, point sources. Okay. And we might wonder whether this internal complexity could spoil the quantum wave behavior of the center of mass motion. Well, there's only one way to find out, and that's to construct so, uh, material. To answer this question, we have set up a new experiment uh, shown in figure three, which we'll get to shortly. It resembles very much the standard Young's double slit experiment, like its historical counterpart. Our setup also consists of four main parts, the source, the collimation, the diffraction grating, and the detector. Actually, I think this is something that was added, and I forgot to take it back out again. Anyway, skipping on down, here is the setup. They have a fullerene oven, which is heated to that really hot temperature. It's got all these little buckyballs, and they're bouncing around because it's hot. And some of them are shot out of it. And they have one where they simply send the fullerenes through. They have another one where they carefully send it through slotted disks that are calculated to only let the ones through that are of a particular velocity. So they're trying to make the, uh, the beam compact in that case. And then they send it through a single slit, they send it through double slits, and then they have a, a grating uh, behind that, and then the, the uh, or actually, no, I take it back. These are two single slits, and then they have the grating behind it. And hopefully they go through two slits that are next to each other, but if there's three slits, it just magnifies the effect. And now they spread out, and then they have the ionizing laser detector, and then they tell you what, you, what happened to it. And here's the stuff using just thermal which can have as much as 60% different uh, uh, energy spread. And you can see that even with that, you have a tall central peak, you have a couple of peaks on either side, and then you kind of lose it. The absence of higher order interference fringes is due to the poor spectral coherence. They're not all the same speed. But now we're going to take, and we're going to slow those down, uh, we're going to take some in the slower range of it, but of a precise speed, and you will see suddenly a whole bunch more fringes popping out. Buckyballs behaving as waves, going through two slits at the same time, and then merging or not merging their, um, the square root of minus one times their uh, probability of being there. I mean, the math, the math works, but uh, it doesn't relate to anything that we intuitively see. But there are the buckyballs showing that they're quantum objects. The entire buckyball. Okay, now, they have some concluding remarks that are particularly helpful to, to look at, I think. Single particle interferometry. Notice they're saying that just one goes through at a time. It isn't two buckyballs bouncing off each other and happening not to go into certain areas. 
It is important to notice that the interference pattern is built up from single separate particles. There is no interference between two or more particles during their evolution in the apparatus. Single particle interference is evidenced in our case by two independent arguments. How do we know it's single? Well, the first argument is based on the spatial separation between the molecules. There are not that many of them. The molecular flux at an average speed of 200 meters per second is about three times 10 to the minus, 10 to the ninth billion um, per centimeter uh, squared per second at the plane of the detector. This flux corresponds to an average molecular density of 1.7 times 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the 11th per meter cubed, or an average molecular distance of about 200 microns, micrometers. This is about three orders of magnitude wider than any realistic range of molecular van der Waals forces, which are typically confined to several uh, hundred nanometers. Um, in other words, they're, it's confined to less than one nanometer, and they're like 200 nanometers apart. So no, they're not influencing each other. The second argument is even more interesting. It's based on the fact that interference occurs only between indistinguishable mo uh, states. However, all molecules may be regarded as being in different states. There are 174 different vibrational modes and the rotational modes can be populated at different energies. The chance of having two subsequent molecules in exactly the same state in all internal modes is vanishingly small. Therefore, interference in our experiments really is a single particle phenomenon. In other words, if these were going to be interfering with each other, if they were going to do the wave thing, by quantum mechanics, they should be in the exact same state going through both sides, but they're not. Therefore, this is all one buckyball that goes through two slits. I mean, try to imagine if I were to tell you that what happened was I threw a pitch and the baseball split and one half went above and one half went below the batter's bat and then went in the catcher's mitt. I, I mean, you know, this is counterintuitive. I guess there's some batters who will tell you that, though. Uh, <laughs> you ever had that experiment where, uh, where, the, where the tennis ball goes right through those holes? No. Uh, <laughs> the um, coherence and which path information. We might believe that coherence experiments could be spoiled by transitions between the many thermally excited states. Obviously, this is not the case, as has been shown by our experiments, but why is this so? No matter what we do, we can only observe one of these qualities in its ideal form at any given time. If we tried to locate the particle during its passage through one of the two slits, say by blocking one of the openings, the interference pattern would disappear. This rule still holds if we do not block the slit but manage to obtain which path information, for example, by, via photons scattered or emitted by the molecules. So you, you know, shine a big light and, oh, this one went through slit A, that one went through slit B, this, uh, and you do that, but the interference pattern would be gone. Sufficiently complex molecules, in contrast to the electrons, neutrons, and atoms used so far, may actually emit radiation without any ex external excitation because they have stored enough thermal energy when leaving the oven. So you get something that looks at the far infrared and whoosh, there went one, I saw it. There went the other one. Why doesn't that ruin the, well, it's very simple actually. According to Bohr's rule, the interference pattern must then disappear if the molecules emit a photon with a sufficiently short wavelength which enables the experimenter to measure the location of the emitting molecule with sufficient precision. According to Abbey's theory of the microscope, the photons should have a wavelength shorter than twice the distance between the slits so that we can figure out which slit that uh, photon came out of. What actually saves the experiment is the weakness of the interaction. The wavelength of the most probably emitted photons 
the ones that you're actually going to see, is about a factor lo of 100 larger than the separation between two neighboring slits. So it looks like it's just all coming from a blur. You can't tell which one. And the number of light quanta that actually leak into the environment is still sufficiently small of the order of one up to potentially a few photons. You just can't see it that well. And cannot disturb the interference measurably. Therefore, even if the fullerene molecule emits a few photons on its path from the source to the detector, these photons cannot yet be used to determine the path taken by the molecule. In other words, the photon state and the molecule state are not or only very slightly entangled because the two possible photon emission states from either path largely overlap. In a sense, we may say that the fullerene has no memory along which path the emission occurred. It comes from both pathways, so to speak. Well, how could you tell? Well, actually, you can't. You could shine a light on it, but then if you did that, you'd mess up the, uh, the uh, interference pattern. Well, we don't stop there. We got even larger molecules. And in uh, Sandra Eibenberger et al. in 2013, uh, did a matter wave interference of particles selected from a molecular library with masses exceeding 10,000 AMU. We're talking some honking big uh, molecules. And there is where you can find it. The quantum superposition principle, a key distinction between quantum physics and classical mechanics, is often perceived as a philosophical challenge to our concepts of reality, locality, or space-time, since it contrasts with our intuitive expectations with experimental observations on isolated quantum systems. While we are used to associating the notion of localization with massive bodies, Quantum physics teaches us that every individual object is associated with a wave function that may eventually delocalize by far more than the body's own extension. Numerous experiments have verified this concept at the microscopic scale, but intuitive waver intuition wavers when it comes to delocalization experiments with complex objects. While quantum science is the uncontested ideal of a physical theory, is really good at predictions, one may ask if the superposition principle can persist on all complexity scales. This motivates matter wave diffraction and interference studies with large compounds in a three grading interferometer configuration which also necessitates the preparation of high mass nanoparticle beams at low velocity. Here we demonstrate how synthetic chemistry allows us to prepare libraries of florous porphyrins we're going to see that in just a minute, which can be tailored to exhibit high mass, good thermal stability, and relatively low polarizability, which allows us to form slow thermal beams of these high mass compounds, which can be detected using electron ionization mass spectrometry. And we present successful superposition experiments with selected spe species from these molecular libraries in a quantum interferometer which utilizes the diffraction of matter waves at an optical phase grating. We observe high contrast quantum fringe patterns of molecules exceeding a mass of 10,000 AMU and having 810 atoms in a single particle. And here are the atoms they're gonna talk about. Now they're gonna start out with a porphyrin, which is a five-membered ring with nitrogen in it. Uh, four of them join together, and th by the way, this is the core of hemoglobin. It's also the core of pretty much the core of chlorophyll. Um, it's a favorite uh, molecule for biochemical reactions because it has this entire ring of bonds, double bonds that are right next to each other, causing something called aromaticity. I won't bore you with that unless you're interested in, uh, in uh, organic chemistry. But the interesting thing of it is now on four places they stick a benzene ring and then substitute fluorine atoms on it. And then they put it in this nasty stuff with sodium hydride, uh, 
one of the most basic compounds we know of, um, which will rip off the hydrogen off of this sulfur, and the sulfur is attack attached to a bunch of carbon atoms that are eventually attached to carbon rings with um, 13 fluorine atoms, and the only reason it isn't 14 is because, well actually, no this isn't rings, this is straight. So this is, it may be straight, it may be branched, it doesn't matter too much. Um, but this is uh, 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 fluorine attached to carbon, uh, completely taking out any hydrogen that would normally be there. And so we've got these really weighty ends on the end, and then this thing attacks one of the fluorines and produces an R where the R could be the fluorine or it could be this long sulfur connected with the uh, uh, connected with the uh, extra carbon and fluorine. So these turns into massive molecules. And if you're wondering how many on an average are there, it's like 12. Um, Uh, there's some with 13, you'll uh, 12 is three substitutions on every single one of these. And here's a mass spectrometry of the, of the mess that they make when they do this. And you can see there's a lot of other stuff that's there too, but you can see that there's some huge ones um, with 13 substitutions, with 12 substitutions few with 14 and 15, a few with 11, 10, 9, and so forth. But they're going to use the ones that are like 12 and 13 uh, in the experiment. And they've car carefully calculated so that gravity makes this thing bend down. And they have collimation slits, and then they have, uh, and then they have the grating they shoot it through. They have a, a interesting... Uh, it's done with a green laser with standing room uh, so that, j so that uh, in between the waves you have very little disturbance at the waves themselves. It's going to knock one of these things out. Um, and then they have another grating that they can use to measure how, how this thing is being deflected. An ionization thing and a, and a uh, a detector. Ionization, of course, is so that a detector will work. And when they do that, they get a really nice sine wave. This curve here is not a theoretical curve. It's an actual fitted curve to the data that we have here. You'll notice that on this end, it tends to get a little bit more scattered. But, uh, but you can see that it fits pretty well to a sine wave. Yeah, big monstrous things with porphyrin and then benzene rings and stuff stuck all over them. Remember, each one of these things that's going through may not even have the same exact molecular structure as the other one. So th what you are seeing is effects with where each molecule interferes with itself. It goes through both holes and then guides itself into the proper place. Our data f confirm the fully coherent quantum delocalization of single compounds composed of about 5,000 protons, 5,000 neutrons, and 5,000 electrons. The internal complexity, the number of vibrational modes, and also the internal energy of each of these particles are higher than those in any other matter wave experiment so far. So now they're the biggest. They're working on bigger things yet. Rem just to refresh your memory, this is the background that we have and you can see single slit and you can see the additional stuff on the double slits. 
Now, my take on this is quantum mechanics has been widely understood as very difficult to understand using a traditional mechanistic model of the universe. You can't figure out how it, how it works that way. You're not alone. The physicists can't figure it out either. Wikipedia differs, but Einstein thought it was impossible to square with a mechanistic view of the universe without some modification. I think it spells the end. We'll discuss that some more uh, next week. It's the end of trying to make the universe into a completely mechanistic uh, place. We will cover more of this next week, as I said. But there are those who stress that the quantum weirdness is confined to subatomic particles, you know, photons, that we can't really see and that the normal world is unaffected. Well, leaving aside the observation that we can see the effects of lasers, light emitting diodes, and transistors, which are all quantum phenomena, we can now see some objects through a microscope that, be, that those objects behave in quantum ways. Our classical world is founded on quantum mechanics, and the effects of quantum rules applies to particles we would normally call classical. These big molecules, there's no way they should be able to go through two slits at once. All of those problems about non-locality and lack of time dependence apply to the real world. And we talked about the quantum eraser that, that tells things to go back and create a pattern. Maybe the real world isn't really real. If so, either God can manipulate the real world, and it's a placeholder, or perhaps he can simply make it up as we go along. And mathematically, I don't know that there's any way to tell. If he can always rewrite the past, then for uh, the difference between that and the past not being there until he decides to write it is uh, difficult. Uh, I don't know how you would find a difference between those two ways of going. We have no business arguing against miracle from a physical standpoint. It happens all the time. <coughs> Things that do not make mechanical sense happen all the time. Literally everything you see, literally all the atoms in your body, all the molecules in your body are quantum objects. This is in opposition to a scientific stance which tried to keep God out because the rules won't let him get in. But that's my opinion, now it's your turn. Okay, a couple of comments here. Go ahead and we'll pass the mic over here. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this is, of course, a very fascinating, interesting, uh, challenging. Um, so much of our world works so well in a mechanistic uh, uh, reference uh, pattern. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you understand sometimes uh, because of this uh, <clears throat> why some uh, why religion has at times yielded to science. Right. <clears throat> Toulman, the University of Chicago, points out that uh, when the church followed Aristotle in the, we call it Dark Ages, Middle Ages is a better term, uh, they kind of uh, yielded to uh, materialism. Mm -hmm. He also points out that when the church followed Newton, uh, they yielded to uh, science again. Yes. And they've been wrong in both cases. Yes. Uh, this tells us we need to be cautious here and not be overwhelmed by uh, the common. And the Bible has, uh, in a way, uh, proven that to follow science doesn't hold up as well as to follow the Bible in terms of endurance. Uh, yes, but this time we have it right. 
Yes, I know. Uh, th th this goes on. I mean, <laughs> just go to human anthropology, physical anthropology, and th th we're so tired of that statement. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, it, you know, it's, it's in a way, it's, uh, this, this adds to the history of this situation. It it's, does. It's part of it, actually. It does. Uh, that uh, uh, don't always uh, follow what seems most reasonable. Yeah, especially most reasonable to people who don't want God interfering in, uh, in nature. Or we might say what seems too s simple. Yeah. Yeah. Things, the reality is more complex. That's right. Yes. Okay, let me see if I have this straight. Uh, you said the buckyball goes through, a single buckyball goes through two slits. Correct. And the buckyball has 60 carbon, carbon atoms. atoms. So do they think that, uh, where does the other 60 carbon atoms come from? <laughs> Is it the same buckyball that goes through both or uh, is it just some information that goes through uh, the other slit? If I could explain that to you exactly, I would probably have the Nobel Prize <laughs> <laughs> in short order. <laughs> Nobody can really explain how a buckyball could go through both slits at the same time and still be one buckyball. But it's the same buckyball. But, uh, but the theory is that the buckyball behaves like it goes through both slits and then rejoins, sometimes positively reinforcing it, where you see peaks and sometimes negatively uh, with destructive interference where you see troughs in the detection apparatus. So it may not be going through both, it just behaves it behaves as if it does. It does okay. because of where it lands on the other side. Trying to say it goes through both does not make intuitive sense. Okay. But the math says it does. Because of where it lands on the other side, they're inferring that it goes through both? That's correct. Okay. So it may, okay. I'll, I'm good with that. Now, is there, <laughs> is, there, uh, is there any magic on two slits? I mean, what if you had three slits? I mean, you get three well, bucket it, balls? It reinforces the pattern. It just reinforces, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, maybe we'll pass the mic over here. Pardon my ignorance, but I'm trying to understand this too. And it seems like if you send one bucky ball through, it lands in one spot. It is only when you send a bunch through that you get your pattern in order to detect. So how do you get from the fact that yes, you have a pattern that has a wave-like pattern, so there's interference. I understand that, but if you send one buckyball through, doesn't it land in one spot and it's randomly where it's gonna land and it's only when you get an accumulative? Well, I probably should correct that slightly. It's not random, it's not pure random. It's semi-random. That is to say, it can la land anywhere, but there are areas where it is much more likely to land and areas where it is much less likely to land. But that doesn't, ha it can do that without having to sp go through both slits, right? Yeah, but what you can't explain without saying it goes through both slits is why it lands in the pattern, uh, why all of them land in the pattern that they do. Because it's the same pattern of interference that it would be if it was a wave hitting it? Exactly. That if you had light that had the same wavelength as monkey <coughs> balls, you could shine the light through it and you would get a clear pattern. And as we saw, you can do electrons. And, and that's because mm -hmm. the wave can go through both slits at the same time because it's a wave. Right. Okay. But particles don't. And like I say, if you, if, if you have a good explanation for that, <laughs> you can be famous. I don't know whether you'll be rich or not, but, well, actually you'll be rich because Nobel Prizes come with a certain amount of money. <laughs> it, it'll, be, it'll be enough to pay your house oh. off. 
Uh, Paul, uh, if you just have one, of course, you're not going to get an interference pattern. No, That's if you have one, you, well, what happens is it lands in a position that is compatible with the interference pattern because the next one will land in this, you know, same pattern and you have, you know, 100, 200 of those, you can start seeing the pattern coming out. I meant one hole, one slit. Oh, split. that's right. One hole, you do one not slit. see that pattern. Those, those wave-like things disappear. I guess if you had one wave, you wouldn't have an interference pattern either. That is correct. That is correct. And as a matter of fact, if you look at those things, they spread out more than they would if you were predicting particles. That is to say, they still have wave patterns. I don't know if you remember looking at uh, last week, you could see there were, there were two different patterns of waves, one of the which was smooth, but then stop, and then another one out beyond. And those ones actually can be calculated as to how big they are by the width of the slit through which the light was going. So there's, there's, there's waves upon waves. When you do two slits, you could see not only the, the big slit, but the, in fact, um, in fact, if you look up at here, let me just turn that light off again, uh, you can see not only the little waves, that's the two slit stuff, but you can also see a wave pattern here. That's from the one slit itself. It doesn't just go s a, a, a broad smear. So there are, there is, there is, even with the one slit, there is wave, um, there's evidence of a wave pattern. Which if you were just, you know, shooting and you would expect the boats to go kind of semi-randomly all the way across. And not to spread out as much as you, th as you see there. Uh, so that you have, you have several different layers of wave behavior. And that's why once this wave behavior was discovered with light, they said, well, light must be a wave. And it took first Planck and then Einstein and then finally Compton to show that light, that light behaves as if it's particles. And Compton showed that it also behaves as if it's particles when it scatters electrons. As light can make electrons deviate from their path by hitting them and bouncing off. Um, but it does so in, as if it was little tiny bullets when it so whenever it's detected, though, it doesn't matter how you do it, it's particles. But whenever it is just allowed to run, it behaves like waves. You look at it, they're particles. You look away, they're waves. Um, like I say, if you can explain that. <laughs> uh, yes, comment back here. Um, just a minute, uh, yeah, it's coming. I have a simple, naive solution. <laughs> That's because I don't know much about the subject. <laughs> um, <coughs> the uh, solution is somewhat philosophical. And that's kind of the way my mind works. <laughs> I'm not always practical. But anyway, we're getting down to the basic nature of reality, let's face it. We're dealing with basic reality. Um, what we always thought was the more you hone in on the smallest entities, subatomic particles, the simpler it would become. What we're now realizing, the more you hone in to the smallest particles, the more complex it may become in terms of behavior. We're dealing with behavior. I think we can probably somewhat agree with that statement for what it's worth. Um, so what we're discovering is reality. The complexity of reality increases as you 
look at it in smaller and smaller quantities, which is counterintuitive. <coughs> we often think of, well, when you look at the vast expanse of the universe and uh, we start finding all kinds of things like black holes, that complexity increases when you look at the bigger picture. But now we're finding complexity increases as you look at the smaller picture. So we're, as a theologian, I have to say we're, we're looking at the mind of God and the complexity of God for whatever that is worth. And uh, we have to be content with mysteries. Um, the, reason, the reason I'm saying all this is that our mind can only look at a few dimensions at once. God's mind can look at all dimensions. And so we're now faced with something beyond what our mind is fully capable in a rational way to figure out. And maybe we never will. <laughs> There's one other thing I think that is important. Quantum mechanics, as, as was mentioned by one of the quotes, uh, is probably the most ideal scientific theory in that it makes predictions that can be tested, that have been tested, and they've pr been proven accurate in some instances uh, to the order of uh, 13, 14 decimal places. Mm -hmm. They're that good. I mean, if, if weather men were able to be accurate to within three decimal places, I think we would, we would find ourselves completely impressed, you know. That is to say, if they said it's sunny, there would be less than one thousandth of a chance that it would rain. We are talking about, you know, multiple zeros beyond that. So that quantum mechanics is a definite theory. It makes definite predictions. And the predictions can be tested and found to be correct to basically as far as we can test. Um, although I'm sure that in other areas uh, they'll be adding more zeros sooner or later. Um, at the same time, quantum mechanics being mathematical is not mechanical. By what, I'm, what I mean by that is that if you conceive of uh, electrons, protons, neutrons, whatever, as little tiny point masses or balls that have a definite radius and that are in a definite place and that move by definite moment, rules of momentum and uh, you know what keeps them bound inside of a nucleus and so forth, um, you're going to be disappointed because not only do these little tiny things behave like they can be in two or three or four places at once? But the uh, uh, but much larger objects behave as if they can be in two or three or four places at once, and it starts to say that we don't really understand reality as well as we should. And that the way to understand it is to understand it, if I can call it that, counterintuitively. And so what we're seeing is uh, that reality doesn't follow the rules that we always thought we had set for it. And not just in the matter of electrons, not even just in the matter of atoms, in the matter of large objects. Everybody's watching to see what's going to happen, but I bet you we're going to find that if we send viruses through 
two slits, they can go through two slits at the same time. Or maybe better behave as if they went through two slits at the same time and yet when they wind up, they can probably be infectious. You know, you figure that one out, there's a Nobel Prize waiting for you. Oh, we've uh, a just couple to of comments add here. One more point oh. while I have the mic. Um, a lot of this is a challenge of uh, determining how best to observe phenomena. And the observation can only come from one point with human observation. We're, we're limited to one three-dimensional point. But if observation can include all points at once, maybe it'll be different. I don't know. You might be right. Where do we go next? Uh, down here and then over there. So this seems to tie together with the concept that everything is information because you, it's a mathematical equation for what the electron truly is. And that gets back to the concept of everything is information. Therefore, it gives a whole new meaning to the fact that everything is from the mind of God. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. I don't know whether I'll have time to, to discuss it next week. Uh, but there is a movement afoot to say, ask, uh, not just on the, on the basis of uh, our, our, by people who are, you know, science fiction writers and stuff, but people are really asking for us ourselves, could we be in a simulation? That what we're de dealing with is just a very complex, <coughs> well-designed, and absorbing uh, uh, video game. Sort of like the Matrix. And there are even some suggestions as to how we might find that out um, and uh, some of them start to make us wonder whether maybe that's what we are in. You know, one of the points that I want to make is that for a long time science has been used as a bludgeon to say you can't believe in miracles because they just don't happen. Well, it turns out that something that could not unreasonably be called miraculous happens all the time and we can watch it. If you heard last week you actually saw a demonstration of some of the uh, uh, some of the waves done with I don't know thirty dollars worth of material or something like that. It's not that expensive. Uh, if you can get polarizing film and you know you can cut it into small pieces you can use pencil leads as a very nice way of uh, of making slits and th three of them together tape them in the proper way um, and uh, and a good powerful laser light I tried using the one uh, that I had at home which was for cats to play with and I guess they don't make them that strong but the pointer works pretty well Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, you know, with that, I'm going to say that, um, that this stuff is real. I mean, it, if you define real as what can be reproduced and shown to you, then it fits everything. If you define real as everything has to be reduced to atoms, and those atoms have a unitary existence and they react to what they see and they cannot react to how you think. Other than, of <coughs> course, if they're in your body and you make them do that. Um, that if that is, if that is well, how you define reality, then you've got the wrong reality. And so the, the attempt to bludgeon people into saying, nope, we have to give up miracles. You don't have to. There is an intelligence out there. <coughs> that intelligence is so far superior to us that all we do is 
vaguely understand some of what he's doing. Where we do understand what he's doing, it's very, very precise, it's very, very mathematical. He likes mm -hmm. math, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it, it does not make mechanical sense all the time. I grew up with uh, one of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit being said that he can be everywhere at once. Mm -hmm. And um, it just popped into my mind. I, I see a relationship, possibly, that this is like a little window on that great reality, I'll say reality, uh -huh. that he can be everywhere at once. You know, in physics there's a thing and I, I wish I could find a good experiment where I can explain to you exactly how that works, but there's something that they call a God's eye view. And it does not include time. Which is fascinating. We may be able to settle the question of whether Augustine was right in the fourth century by modern physics. And he probably was. Uh, repeating myself a little bit from last week, but in different terms, the uh, causality does seem to fall apart on a fairly simple uh, level. Um, one of the questions you face uh, discussing uh, these issues uh, something is where did God come from? And uh, you can easily counter it by saying where did the universe come from? Uh, the fact is we face in both instances, we don't know, we don't have any good plan for it. Cause and effect has to fall apart because, you know, um, nothing can come from nothing, at least we we have that concept, but apparently uh, something has come from nothing here. Uh, and so uh, causality is too simple. Well, if you have a God who is eternal, then he didn't come from nothing because he never came. And, uh, you know, the, the, our, our present... Me mechanism, mechanism doesn't uh, yeah. think our, in terms of those terms of eternity. Yeah. Our present... Uh, universe is not a candidate for coming from nothing because under the most optimistic uh, assumptions you project it back it comes to a point some uh, best estimate right now I think is about 13.7 billion years but you know if it's 14 if it's 12 it doesn't really matter um, and at that point, none of the laws of physics work um, because they get things with zero in the denominator. Uh, and mathematically, that doesn't work. Uh, and so the universe popped forth, the universe popped forth miraculously. And either it was created in different places at different times that God decided well now I want a galaxy here well, now I want a galaxy there which he could do or else the matter has but the matter is not eternal it goes back to a point and stops even like I say under the most optimistic assumptions or pessimistic assumptions depending on whose side you're on um, and uh, so, as far as, you know, trying to say, well, what's the original cause? Well, now you're not left with the universe. The Democrates <coughs> argument won't work anymore. Uh, which Aristotle felt required to follow. The universe has always been here. Uh, that won't work. So now what you have to have is a universe creating machine that has always been there or else God. And if you want to know how badly some people want to avoid the concept of God, 
They'll go with the universe creating machine. <laughs> with no designer, but good enough to create universes. Uh, think about it. Pretty desperate. Yeah. Anyway, next week, we're going we're gonna to go and talk about uh, the zero universe theory. That's opposed to the multi-universe theory, but it's also opposed to the one universe theory. Um, and I should have, uh, there's a really good talk by a guy who uh, gave it to Google, uh, to Google employees. They, they have this thing where they, um, and uh, he rambles a little bit, but he, he actually hits the most important points, and I'm going to give that to you. And you, you can look at it uh, before you come, and, and you'll be, uh, it'll be a little easier to see where I'm going with this.